Um, yeah. My mic sounds nice. Check one. My mic sounds nice. Check the boy. This boy the is trouble already because the boy bounced the. Oh, oh. Oh. Yeah, you're on camera. Huh. So behave. Okay. What did I get myself into with? I just drank some coffee, so That's so pardon so me. Gross. Check. We got the compressors running. Oh yeah. I don't know. Mm. Is that ADS? Ew. <laughs> No, that's what the AS, ASMR, whatever the kid's talking about. I think about ADSR, attack, delay. Okay, Elliot, focus. Re- Elliot, oh, hello, release. focus. Okay. okay. Um, Miles, so we have someone coming in right after us. Check. No, you're good. Okay, right. so yeah. I have like 10 minutes to yeah, play yeah, with. Definitely. Yeah, you're fine. Okay, Elliot, I have some questions for you. We're not starting yet, but I have some, I like to do some prep, some prep questions. Okay. So we're just going to close our eyes for a few seconds and come into the room. So just like 10 seconds. Okay. What do you think your core message is in life? Make beats and treat people with respect. Cool. Okay, cool. Um... Like, what do you want, when you do these sort of interviews, what do you want people to walk away with, generally? And then I have a more specific question after that. I want, I want folks to know more about the work that we're doing and um, to understand why it's important and how it might be applicable to their lives and to know more about the organization and, um, yeah, to be excited about new and innovative things that they may not have thought about before. Or to give them perhaps a little more information to, I don't know, understand and justify what they might be doing that might be a little bit alternative or... um... Perfect. That's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. So this is great to showcase like what you do. Um, You know that like founder stories really can come from your story and then the organizational story we can talk about more specifically at the end and Mm -hmm. like call to actions, how people can get involved. Yeah. But the front end is really about like, um, I wanted to go over like kind of the... Like, I think it's so cool, the academics of their, like, hip-hop and, like, therapeutic application and a little bit about how you got there. And then, finally, like, so some of our audience might not – some of our audience are people that, like, are, at, like, at their limits with trauma processing. Like, they might yeah. come to this podcast because they're like, what is trauma? I think I have it, maybe. Mm-hmm. But um, but they might just already be disillusioned with the whole thing. Yeah. So, um, and don't forget you're on camera. So I, am. I, need, I need a toothpick or a, <laughs> I need to get my dental floss. Um, do you want to get your dental floss? Can I please? Yeah. It's going to drive me nuts throughout the whole interview. <laughs> That's real life, y'all. That, that is real. I stay flossy. Hey, I have my toothbrush, my toothpaste, my floss. I, I'm like a Are girl. Are supposed scout. to floss twice daily or just once? Um... I think it, if you can floss as many times as possible, I think is a good thing. Do you want? I have my floss. It's way more accessible. Should I get that? I mean, you know, I don't mind. Yeah. You get to see all the all the floss, the other floss that we have here. You know, all these beautiful hats and t-shirts and insane. And I need to put this away. Wait, I want a hat and t-shirt. Oh, we can arrange this. Are you are you talking about like doing a five panel, a dad hat? Do you want a? Uh, um, also, additionally, I need I need music for my intro and outro. Oh, I, I got you covered for that. Easy. So they, these are some of the, and these are Indonesian dad hats. Yeah, Indonesian. You can style them, Jess. Hey, I need to. That that matches your outfit. Yes, I want that. Yeah. Yes. All right. Yes. Oh my god. And usually we charge people for these, but you're good people. Uh. We're good people, so. Um, do you, you want any other swag? Like, uh, yeah, it's let's handle it afterwards because we only have like a set amount of time okay. to. Right yeah, now. we're already twenty minutes over. Oh no! Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. So and we only have about. All right. then my we'll only have like go. forty minutes to talk or thirty. Oh, yeah. So yeah, it goes fast. I love you. Shall I wear my matching hat? You should wear matching hat. Just okay. get, just get, get, get just get here. with it. Okay. So we're gonna program Alex. <laughs> All right. Well, what are there. <laughs> I'm gonna drive you crazy. It's already it's already happening. It's oh happening. my god. Okay. I'm taking my phone off the table so it doesn't vibrate. Okay, okay. I'm putting it's my on phone on here because this is where my questions are. Mm-hmm. Um flash. Flash sauce. Jerk. So just cancel on me. 
Are you feeling better? I'm feeling so much better. That's what you get for eating a bagel or a roll before the interview, isn't it? Okay. Um, all right. You ready? Did you? Anyway, you can get that later. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I will fetch that later. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Okay. Welcome to I'll Go First. I'm Jessica Minhas, and I am joined by actually a very, very dear friend, Dr. Elliot Gann. He's a neuropsychologist, a no, no, psychotherapist. No, no. I, I'm, not, I'm not a neuropsychologist. I'm a clinical psychologist. Elliot, oh, you kill me. Oh, I'm killing you. Sorry. I'm... He is, what am I going to do with him? We are dear friends, so this is I'm why trouble. we can give each other shit. But, so, sorry, you're a, why don't you just take it? I mean. I just don't want it, people being ahead. like, you're, just, you're not a neuropsychologist. Okay, just go. So I'm a, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. Uh, I'm also a beat maker, DJ, and executive director of a nonprofit called Today's Future Sound. Yes, and I am wearing the very cool hat. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. It, ma- so it matches great. your outfit, too. Hey, you know, I got to get with it. Sauce. Okay, so Elliot and I, do you want me to call you Elliot or Dr. Gant? Elliot, you can call me Elliot. I want to call you Dr. Gant, so Whatever you want. I think that's so dope. I'm okay, easy. so Thank Dr. Gant. I think you're so dope. Oh, gosh. Um, he and I met in Israel, of all places. We were both fellows for a program called Reality Fellowship. Um, we were on the wellness tour, and what I like so much about you, Elliot, is that no matter where you are, you are yourself. And you are so enthusiastic about what you do. And I have never heard of this kind of therapy modality. So I would love, first of all, maybe it's, maybe let's take a step back. What on earth is therapy modalities? Because I know I can get kind of caught up in like using jargon, but Mm -hmm. can you just tell us like high level, what is today's future sound? And then kind of like walk us through like what you specialize in. Yeah, absolutely. So you want me to talk about therapeutic modalities and then what is today's future sound? I mean, I'm all over the place. So okay. Okay, let's, okay, let's go back and tell you talk you tell us what okay. future today's future sound yeah. is. So today's future sound is the nonprofit of which I'm executive director. We're based in Oakland, California, but we do work on a local, national and re- and uh, international scale. Uh, and we use hip hop beat making, electronic music production and hip hop culture as a culturally responsive mental health educational intervention and also I would I view it as uh, having components of cultural diplomacy to unpack all that um, we're addressing mental health needs from whether it be trauma right being exposed to to community violence or you know interpersonal or familial trauma um, or and or associated depression and anxiety lack of self-esteem those kinds of things underperforming in schools, which may be associated with those kinds of things, or maybe kids are just having academic troubles because school isn't right for them. It's you know, not a one-size-fits-all mo- model. Kids learn in different ways, and so we use hip-hop culture, which is comprised of DJing and beat-making kind of come as a package together. So DJing, MCing, which would be like rapping, right? Um, the dance component, which is breaking, b-boying, b-girling, uh, graffiti, the visual element, and the fifth element of hip hop is knowledge. That means knowledge of self and knowledge of the culture of hip hop. So, hip hop is is very metacognitive. It, it's you think about thinking, you think about yourself, you think about your identity. So, we essentially um, hip hop had all of this: the, the educational, the therapeutic, the empowerment is all baked into hip hop culture. We didn't invent it. We're just saying, hey, we're highlighting parts of hip hop culture and the practice practices of hip hop and modern. Um, kind of uh, popular music culture, but especially hip hop that already has therapeutic and educational and empowerment built in. And here's why and how, as a, as a clinical psychologist and someone who does stu- study the neurophysiological impact of trauma and of beat making and that kind of thing on the body, the mind, and you know, the mind-body connection, how is this useful? How can we highlight how this can be used and is used for millions of people? Even rapping, right, affects the brain in, t- in the way that rhythm ties the, uh, the nervous system together. This and is so cool. So I'm really interested in creating a rationale, or a rationalization, a, um, a kind of a logical scientific model for why, how and why hip-hop, music, arts, drama, et cetera, all these kinds of things are really therapeutic and helpful and how, it, how we can and should be using them in schools, in community settings, in forensic settings, in juvenile justice settings. Um, and you know, there's a lot of stigma around hip hop, uh, yeah. a lot of negative stereotypes. I think, uh, you know, a lot of misunderstanding and people don't really understand what the original culture of hip hop is about. 
that it was about healing and empowerment and stopping violence, not creating right, or, right. or perpetuating it. And that hip hop came out of the South Bronx in the early 70s. It came out of a lack of resources. It came out of you know marginalized populations, African American, Afro Latino folks who really were up against a, a really racist white supremacist system where they had no resources and where landlords were burning down their tenements to collect insurance money, where they That's had built a, a freeway th through that displaced thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And it left only black and brown folks who, you know, the government didn't care about. And there was a lot of gang warfare. There's a lack of resources. So in order to stop the, the gang warfare, um, there was a shift. And the gangs who were teenagers, really, your kids, literally, agreed, we're going to stop killing each other. This is getting crazy. And instead, we're going to settle our disputes through battles, through hip hop, whether it be a rap battle or more often a b-boy or b-girl battle, a breaking battle. Folks call it break dancing. In the culture, it's called breaking or b-boying or b-girling. And they used to have battles to settle turf disputes to cut out the violence. Now, breaking is very aggressive, and you'll see people feigning violence because these are ex-gangbangers, right? Wow, yeah. But they're settling it in a peaceful way, and they came together underneath the flag of the universal Zulu nation which was bringing all the gangs together who had been warring before that and creating solidarity. And the ethos of hip-hop culture in the Zulu Nation was peace, love, unity, and having fun. Now, all this comes back to today's future sound because when we think about beat making, not only is there a kind of a neurophysiological regulation of our stress response, like when we get stressed out, we're flooded with cortisol, and, and it's good for being in the moment for responding to stressful or dangerful, uh, dangerous situations, but when we're no longer in the dangerous situation and we're, we, we're retaining that trauma, that shock that overwhelmed our system, we're hypervigilant and we respond to things in a way as if they were dangerous when they're not. And it interferes with our ability to function in day-to-day -day life. Repetitive beats, right, put people into light trance-like states and calm us down. That's why when you rock So it's a almost baby, like a regulatory it's, component. It's not almost. It is a regulatory That's component. That's crazy. I've never thought of that before. Yeah, so you rock a baby rhythmically, and you, and you kind of modulate your voice and bring it down. And you may talk to it in a lower voice like this. Or, oh, when you want to excite it, but when you want to calm it down, you bring your voice down, and you bring down the tempo, and you rock it slowly. Just like when you hug someone that's freaking out or is, like, crying or dysregulated, you contain them, you hug them, you hold them, right? Hold them close. And you help to lower their heart rate and their breathing and make them feel contained and safe, usually unless they had a really messed up childhood. And then hugging may be really scary right? because, you know, they're, right. they're held in a, a passive, restricted position. But you can you kind of rock someone when they're, when they're weeping or something like that. You calm them down by slowly rocking them rhythmically back and forth. We, as Dr. Bruce Perry says, who's a trauma, like one of the foremost trauma experts in the world, our nervous system is tied together by rhythm, by rhythms, by rhythmic relations, patterns of talking, nonverbal cues, by rhythmic elements, kind of musical rhythmic ele elements. And our brain and our body processes things different, processes information and, and sensory experiences differently when we use rhythm. So not only are we using rhythm as part, which is naturally part of hip hop and other cultures, it's kind of a universal thing as right. music is. Yeah, so it like really crosses these divides. And uh, divides. I remember you saying that like a lot of your work is in inner city schools. Yeah. So, like, um, when, one interview that you did, you talked about, like, how your skin color isn't the same as theirs and how you might come from a different socioeconomic background. Yep. But actually, this, like, divide of hip hop really, like, crosses those boundaries. Yeah, I think, look, as long as you're authentic, because people know when you're being inauthentic, right? And, and especially, you know, the kids that I work with, the young people and the folks that I work with. They know when someone's fake. They, they've been tricked. Right, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Or, or people have tried to trick them their entire life. And that hypervigilance. So like hypervigilance. The they'll, they'll, people will smell you out within a second, literally. Within yeah. a second or two, they'll, they'll pick up on your body language They'll because they have to out of survival. So I try to be authentic. I'm, I love hip-hop. I participate in hip-hop culture. I know it's not a white phenomenon. It was not invented by white people, and I know that white folks have appropriated it. So I'm very, I try to be very respectful of both the history and the culture, and I don't go around being like, yo, I'm hip-hop. I participate in it, but you know, it's, I'm, I'm not a native of hip-hop in the way that African-American and Afro-Latino folks, especially who are from New York, who are from the culture where it, from where, because I can go home and talk white to my mom, and that's how I communicate. And so I, there's different discourses, different places we talk in different ways. But, you know, and I'm a little, I, I interface a little bit differently. I may talk a little bit differently. I may move a little 
a little bit differently, but there's still the, the, the core element of who I am. And part of who I am is a hip hop artist. I'm a beat maker and a DJ and I can freestyle, I can rap, I can do you know a bunch of different stuff that's part of the culture of hip hop. But I also am gonna bring my true, uh, my quote unquote true self or my, my personality that I think is fairly consistent across settings in different discourses. How, like let's, um, I, I like wanna back up a little bit and talk about like how in the world, like you are from like New York City, you are white, mm -hmm. <laughs> and how did you, first of all, like why psychology and then how in the world like did hip hop come into that? Okay, why psychology? My mom is a psych psychoanalyst, psychologist. My dad is a psychiatrist, psychoanalyst. Wait. My stepmom is a psychiatrist. Psychoanalyst. There's more. There's more psychology beyond the stepmom. Oh, it keeps going. Oh yeah. Okay. So mom, dad, stepmom, step grandfather, who actually was one of the first people to write, um, at least in, uh, to my knowledge, in the scientific academic community on the impact of rhythm on the nervous system and the psyche. And what? used to de and used to deprogram cult members, for real with yeah. rhythm. Well, no, the, he he noted that a lot of the um, the the ceremonies and the indoctrination involved low frequency banging of low frequency drums, in a, in in a synchronized group rhythmic kind of activity, right? Chanting and banging drums, and this puts people, especially highly suggestible people, oftentimes people have been exposed to trauma, but also some people are just more susceptible to it, right? And so when you put people into trance-like states through the repetitive beats, you can also, they become even more suggestible. They go into a trance-like state. They become hypnotized. And so they're programming people, right, for these cults. Yeah. That's why, the, you know, this is in religion too. And this is, like, this is when? Um, it's when like the 60s, he, uh, 60s and 70s that he was um, doing, doing this work. Now, that wasn't everything that he did, but he was writing on this too. So he was, uh, to my knowledge, and obviously I'm biased because he's you know part of my family, but to my knowledge was one of the first people to, to really write on this, but from a, a um, neurophysiological uh, kind of phenomenological w way. And then now we're seeing more of the psychiatric and psychological and wellness communities saying, hey, we actually have the, the neurophysiological evidence and know more about our nervous system and you know body body mind mind body connection. So this kind of like runs in your family. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, so for me, I think that part of you know coming from a legacy of I was going to say of beat makers, and that would have been a really good Freudian slip. Mm. Coming from a legacy of uh, psychoanalysts, psychologists, psychiatrists. And my, my aunt was a psychoanalytically oriented social worker. It, it, it you know, we're, we're also Jews, so it, it's, it's part of our kind of, it's the Jewish science from Vienna, as uh, Woody Allen said. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just kind of, that's part of my cult family cultural DNA. Um, it's kind of like questioning and examining. Questioning, examining, a lot of, you know, intellectual, philosophical kind of uh, conversations, debates, but also I think the, the helping, right, and the, and the trying to heal. And I think... Most folks, most folks have some kind of trauma or baggage anyway, right? But um, a lot of folks in the mental health field, if not most, have their own, you know, baggage yeah, or personal story sure. that, you know, their hurt, their wound, their traumas that led them to want to help others because we're empathic, we're sensitive, we want to help other people. Um, and so, you know, I think I, I'm, I'm not going to speak too much on my, my parents' stuff because I don't really have their permission to do so. Yeah, of course, yeah. But, but you know, I know that, you know, my, my parents had their experiences that um, I think, you know, left them wounded in one way or another. And, and I believe this was an attempt for them to try to, to heal and to reconcile that. Now, so I have my own um, kind of story, which is centered around uh, my parents' divorce when I was five, which definitely affected my personality and my development. Um, and, you know, the the way that I interface with people and personal relationships and this kind of thing. Now, I think I'm pretty solidly grounded, but, you know, I'm, I'm kind of neurotic. I got my own stuff. Um, but the way that I was able to kind of tell my story and my narrative is this kind of synthesis of psychology and helping and empathy and social justice uh, and then also the artistic and musical expression. I was always into art and music as a kid. I was, you know, 
narrating my own radio shows as like when I was like eight or nine and I would play vinyl records and talk over it and have my own radio show, right? So I was DJing from, uh, quote unquote, DJing from a young wow, age. Wow, that's so cool. And I, by the time I was 11 or 12, I was, you know, working with the first like sound editing programs that were available on computers at like my school and, and like trying to make music. I had music in my head. and So that was just like a part of your child and your expression. Totally. Yeah, and so I was listening to a lot of like oldies and rock, and you know. Kind what of, were some of the like artists that you were listening to when I was nine or ten, I mean, twelve? Yeah, or? when you think back, like what what are some of the ones so that really got, inspired you? I got really into fifties and sixties oldies. I, the Beach Boys in fourth grade were one of my favorite groups. I was also big on like the Rocky Horror Picture soundtrack. Um, I got into David Bowie and Lou Reed. I also remember through the, the so I bought these oldies tapes you could get at like swap meets or flea sales or uh, flea markets. And so yeah. I got, you know, I, I heard like Al Green for the first time and Roy Orbison and um, James Brown when I heard uh, I Feel Good. I remember. So 86th Street here in New York, there's um, a billiards hall. And I used to love going to play billiards. And they had a jukebox with 45s. And I heard James Brown, I Feel Good. And I just thought it was the coolest song ever. So I would always play that. So I got, you know, and then classical music from my dad. My dad used to play piano and so kind of all that. And then growing up in New York City during the golden age of hip hop, which is like the renaissance period of, of, of hip hop, considered the best, the peak era. Um, I was coming of age, you know, when Wu-Tang came out, like, like and it, you know, Enter the 36 Chambers came out. This is how I, de this is how I remember my years, by what hip hop albums came out. So fifth grade... The kind of the inception of the birth was hearing Insane in the Membrane, the summer of fourth grade, and seeing that and just being like, what is this? This is the dopest. That just like lighted is, you up. Like, what is this? This is what I've been waiting for. This is the best part of the song repeating again and again. The energy is there. It's just, it's just it captures the angst and the feeling and the groove and the funk. That and Scenario by A Tribe Called Quest. And that was fifth grade. And I remember Lauren Adolfson, rest in peace, she brought in a tape cassette single of Scenario by Tribe Called Quest, and we had a boombox, and it was so dope because my fifth grade, I had requested to be in this teacher's class because he made this kind of rockumentary video music thing where we would lip sync, we'd dress up as different rock figures, popular music figures who shaped rock and roll. So I asked to be in his class, and I was like listening to George Thorogood and all this stuff and the Beatles and all that kind of thing, and um, I got to, I mean, I'm the whitest dude ever. I, I played Robert Johnson you know, the, which is like, it's kind of messed up, but I guess, you know, there, it wasn't a very diverse school. It was a bunch of rich white kids, um, rich white Jewish kids for the most part. But I really learned more about the blues and about Robert Johnson and, and the impact that he played. And hip hop, you know, A Tribe Called Quest, that really, that like, that was it. And I was like, wow, what is this? And then, you know, Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, you know, Doggy Style came out, the, the East Coast stuff, Wu-Tang. Um, and being here in New York City, having access to that, I got even deeper and deeper in high school. I started going to a lot of shows. I used to go down to SOBs, uh, Tramps before it was closed. I see all these underground hip hop shows, t like turntablists, like the, the executioners. I'm getting really deep and nerdy now, but I was super deep into it. that. And also really into electronic music. They called it Electronica. It's been rebranded as EDM. 20 years later. Wait, what, electronic dance music? Yeah, so like Daft Punk, The Prodigy, Fatboy Slim, um, like deeper house music, drum and bass and jungle coming from England. And I was listening to trip hop, like I was really into Tricky and Porter's Head, right? And that's the sounds of Bristol. That's kind of like England's answer to, you know, the, the East Coast New York hip hop that was coming out. And, and, was, and at this point, you're like, you're still in high school, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and I was going to a bunch of underground hip hop. What is like your... What are your parents saying about like? Oh, but I mean, well, look, my, my parents had their own kind of internalized racist thing about like hip hop and what it was, and they didn't understand it, um, and like, why are you trying to be black? That kind of thing. And I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't like, yo, yo, you know what I mean? But yeah, even so, they were, I think they had their stereotypes. Since then, I've kind of educated them about it. And, and you really are, um, just on that note, you really are like an educator on the like, almost the science of hip hop. Like I was listening to so many of your interviews and I'll link to them um, in our show notes and also under the YouTube video. But it's so fascinating. Like you are really like an, a, truly like an academic in the nature of hip hop, not just like the culture of it, the history of it, but like the actual, like how it works and the, the musicality of it. 
But, like, I think that's so neat. So, like, here you are, like, you're this little white kid in these, like, underground hip-hop places. Do they, like, accept? I was a medium-sized white kid. Like when I was in high school, I was a little taller. Oh, excuse me. You are you are pretty tall. Okay. Hey. Hey, you stuck out. You stuck out back then. Yeah. No. I. I mean, yes and no. There. There. It wasn't like there weren't any white people, but definitely. Um, you know, you got more flack for it. You were like perhaps a poser or a wannabe, right? And there was the whole W word. You know, that was like, yeah, not a big fan of that. But that was like a '90s thing, right? That that phrase. You know, right, that right. I'm, right. That I'm not going to repeat. Yeah, don't. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, look, I mean, to me, I knew that I loved music and that it moved me in a way that was really spoke to something that was kind of ineffable that I couldn't put into words exactly that I couldn't synthesize. And then as I started to, you know, have more cognitive development, I got older and I had learned more about things. I started to be able to kind of put that into words, and I think that that's what I've started to. Um, kind of elaborate on and and to really t- try to try to parse out and what a lot of my collaborators have done as well my research and kind of academic collaborators and community collaborators really trying to put into words and through concepts uh, what is the value of what we're doing and what are we doing what's the value of music and hip hop and culture how does that tie us together how does that empower us how does that help us to develop our identity and our sense of self and so my sense of self and my identity was synthesized through the input of the, the psychological, the familial, the social justice, which tied into also the hip hop, the music, and Did the art. Did you think that you would be a psychologist? Or yeah. Being, you yeah just... I was, when I was a senior in high school, I was either going to study at, at college, I was going to study cultural anthropology or psychology. And I had already been working with kids and kind of doing, you know, been a, a junior camp counselor. And then my senior year of high school, um, I went to... Croatia and Bosnia, and I worked with kids that had grown up during the war with wow. war traumatized Bosnian yeah. Muslim, and they were all mixed, you know, ethnicities and religions, whatever. Um, but I worked with kids who had been who literally couldn't go outside or go to the water, and had grown up during the war in the '90s, and so I was coming in in the late '90s. These kids were seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So we were teaching them to swim on this remote, tiny little island off the coast of Split in Croatia. And it was a profound existential experience for me because I realized I was, I mean, I already knew I was sensitive and empathic and I want and kind of a healer, caretaker, listener. But I realized that I was really good at it in the way that I could interface with the kids. And I already kind of knew that from working with kids. Um, and the way that I felt that they reacted to me and what I was able to do with them and understand them and play with them and and kind of help them, I would say, through relationship. But this really kind of sealed the deal. So I'm going into my first year of college, having gone to travel to Europe by myself for the first time, having gone to Croatia and, and Bosnia, having seen buildings, skeletons of buildings for blocks. Yeah, you know, it really like, changes you when you see that kind of stuff. I remember yeah. when I first went to... India I was 19 and um it was just I was so opening why like eye opening I always think it's so important for young people to go and see like the world and really get a bigger perspective cuz it like you're saying it can That's be a real education. life-changing it, it was life-changing and and so that further helped me with kind of my uh young adult development adult development trajectory and bringing in the hip hop and the music and how important that was to my identity and the need, this hunger to create and participate in hip hop and to create music and to make my own music and wanting to learn how to DJ and scratch and dance and do graffiti, all this stuff I just thought was the coolest stuff in the world. It was so expressive. That's what, what, what hip hop really is. And this is what I kind of present on to kids and adults alike. Because you also, just as a side note, mm. you you present, like, we talk about, like, hip-hop, which I, I, like, I'm over the moon. I think that's so cool. But you also, like, are really an educator on processing trauma. Yeah. And, and it's all baked into hip-hop. Yeah. Because hip-hop came from struggle and trauma, severe trauma, intergenerational trauma, you know, intergenerational transmission of trauma, the trauma of being not white or being black in America, right? And, and just so many different kind of things and hip-hop was a way for folks to say i have value i have a voice our voice is voiced through hip-hop culture through the the lyrics the beats that we make the way that we exist with pride in our own culture 
that we've created despite being robbed of our culture and our history and our heritage, you know, for African American folks and Afro Latino folks who were kidnapped and brought over to the United States or to the to the Caribbean, right? And and for you know, some of the folks have Taino blood, have indigenous, you know, blood as well. But they've been robbed of their culture and told that their culture is bad and that it, they shouldn't, they're not allowed to practice it or know about it, right? And so I think it was a way for, for those folks to say, no, nah, not only can you not silence us, we have a voice, but to create a counter narrative to the mainstream white supremacist narrative that, that's in our history books, the statues in our cities, the baked into our cultural DNA here in the United States where we live on stolen land, stolen from indigenous folks, right? So it's like really an outcry. Because like, I say that also because when I think of hip hop, I I grew up in hip hop. That was like I grew up in a very white community. I was brown and I didn't understand like my race at all. And I thought uh -huh. for a really long time, like I just related way more to the like black community and to like the Latin community. I didn't actually meet real Indian people until I was in college. Yeah. And that was really eye opening. But I think like part of the um like I don't know, like bias or like sensitivity for maybe with parents or like older people with their kids listening to hip hop is like the nature of the the lyrics but what I hear you really emphasizing is that this is like such an expression of how we process stuff and the I, I also love what you say and you said this in one of your interviews about how this like kind of restarts the conversation between these very different groups of people. Yeah I think it really bridges like as you started to talk about before there's a certain through the culture of hip hop and the rituals and the like the discourse, you know, like I, if you see a, a circle of people rapping or dancing, what we call a cipher in hip hop, you have to know how to approach it. You can come into the circle. You have to either take your turn. The mic gets passed or you have to jump in. And if you jump in and if you interrupt, you have to be ready to battle someone. Someone might, you know, say insult you or, or try to test your skills. And hip hop is about your individual identity your skills, your style, your swagger, who you are. You can, you can sample, you can take pieces of what people did before, but you can't be a biter. You can't steal and say it's, and, and say it's yours. You have to put your own spin on it and remix it. And that's what's really cool about hip hop is that it's a remix culture. It takes, it steals, borrows, appropriates from everywhere, remixes and synthesizes something new. And that's creating, uh, to me, that's also creating new narratives, right, for each individual. This is who I am. This is my super, we tell the kids that we teach, we teach kids to make beats and we say, we want you to not only name your song, but what's your, I, I say, what's your superhero hip hop name going to be? What's your beat making DJ name, rapping name going to be? You get to choose, it's like choose your own adventure, but unlimited. And so instead of, you know, if kids or people have been um, recipients, uh, recipients of trauma, but have been victims of trauma and put in a passive position where they were, you know, that passive victim. We're saying, no, we're going to give you autonomy and choice, and you're going to get to create your own narrative and your own story and your own identity on your own terms so that you can have this other identity which is separate from the trauma. And it should be anyway. I mean, the goal in psychotherapy when, when addressing trauma is trying to help folks create a cohesive narrative to make sense of the split off different pieces of trauma that we store in our body, our mind, our psyche, right? To integrate it into a digestible narrative that doesn't overwhelm us and make us dissociate, freak out, need to go use drugs or, you know, whatever it is we need to dissociate to cope with the trauma that overwhelms us. And to put it into a, a, like a, a musical form or in the case of graffiti, it could be a visual form. There's a certain catharsis, a cathartic release, ah, like getting rid of the, the stress, the aggression, the sadness, putting it out there and expressing it and, and creating a narrative. And I think we can do this not only verbally, as it's kind of traditionally been put forth in, in trauma treatment and psychotherapy, but also in these expressive ways. And so I think through nonverbal, nonverbally through beat making, because a lot of the trauma that happens is pre-verbal. It, it doesn't happen to us in a verbal way. Yeah, trauma. it's it so hard happen to, us to in a verbal way. talk about it. So we should be able to express it in nonverbal ways as well, in healthy ways, right, that help us to cope. And so I have a friend who was suicidal. And was really struggling with things and, and knows a good deal about mental health himself. And he's dedicated his life to helping other folks. But he was just really going through it. And he said, man, you know, the therapeutic bee making model you're talking about, like, it works to bring down my anxiety, my overwhelming anxiety, the depression. And he actually worked in as, as a practitioner, you're saying. He, he, of sorts, yeah. 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 Um, and, and he said, man, it really, it really helps. 
it, like your model really works. And I'm, I'm not just throwing things out randomly. No, this is all science it, based. It's yeah. science, it's science and culturally based. It's based on best practices from non-Western or non-white cultures. Um, and you know, like th this is not a white Western European Eurocentric modality of making music, of coping with trauma, right? Is because you don't have like, we're in the third generation or iteration now, second or third iteration of hip hop therapy. Like there's, there were the, the innovators in the 80s That's and the okay. 90s. Then there's the second wave in kind of like the late 90s, early 2000s. So one of the folks who is an incredible innovator, I think he'd be considered first, maybe second wave, is Dr. Edgar Tyson, rest in peace. He's the, he was the mentor to one of my closest you know, colleagues and collaborators, J.C. Hall, who runs a hip hop therapy program in the South Bronx at Mott Haven Community High School, which is a transfer high school in the South Bronx. He has transformed that space, literally built a studio and decorated it, and has kids coming in who have unimaginable trauma, who don't go, to, who, who haven't been able to go to school, whether they're in juvie or have been cutting school or just dealing with severe trauma. He has kids in there processing their trauma through hip hop, coming to school, GPA has changed, attendance has changed, the way they conceive of themselves has changed because he's doing it in a culturally responsive way, in a non-judgmental way and saying, I take you as you are, I'm not gonna force some white paradigm. You know, and look, I, I, I'm in my own therapy and I love it and I think it's great. I think everyone should be in therapy. It doesn't have to be the white traditional Eurocentric talk therapy. There are other ways of doing it. Yeah, one of my mentors says there's so many ways up a mountain. Um, in terms of like how we process stuff. And I, that's one reason I was so excited to have you on the show is because this is such a unique way to, um, you know, address the stuff that's really holding you back or the stuff that's really painful in your life. And one thing we talked about like prior to recording was just about how there are so many different ways to um, support yourself in that healing process. Can you talk a little bit about like, how do you figure out what it is that like, what is your unique thing? Like, just like your, what is your DJ name, by the way? Uh, my, my producer DJ name is Philip Drummond. What's the, what's the? He's the dad from Different Strokes. <laughs> you have to be a certain age to get that. Yeah. Yeah, and that was given to me kind of in the tradition of hip-hop culture. A lot of times you're given a name by someone. So uh, shout out to Lexi Benaim, um, who put me up on Mark Ronson before Mark Ronson was famous who told me about, uh, what was his name, Saigon, before Saigon blew up. Like, this kid this kid was in high school and middle school, like, just knowing about every dope thing that was happening in New York and, like, underground culture and, like, just... So, anyway, shouts to him. So, knowing knowing that, that he was always up on game and was just, like, the flyest kid. He, he was, like, three or four years younger than me, and I just knew he was, like... And he was the one who, like... He's, he was, like... Knighted you with your Yeah, name. I came back, I came back from, from college my freshman or sophomore year, and I had been using... A much cheesier name and he's like yo you should be philip drummond and i was like oh that's hard as fuck that's really good because philip drummond's this rich white guy so it's not being inauthentic like I, I come from a privileged place i'm white it's clear but to me the metaphor is like embracing black culture embracing you know ghetto culture and he's kind of bringing in Car gary coleman and i forgot the other guy is a derrick or something like that but um and it, and all the hip-hop heads know it too like if you're 30 or older maybe 32 or older so as soon as I say that, that's why the guys before in the, the, the show in there, I said Philip Drummond, and you all saw them. They're like, they're like, oh, you know what I mean? Yeah, he, that guy gave me that guy, he, and he gave me a pound, right? Yeah. So there was another show that was actually recording next door. We're at Gotham Podcast Studios, um, and there was another show two doors down, and they released. I know, I know a few of the um, guys on the show, um, and yeah, like I could feel it in the room. Well, they were testing me because they're like, uh, is this some? Is this like another corny, corny ass white yeah, like boy who's trying to appropriate black culture and like front and like he's into hip hop? And so as soon as Elliot ball? walked in, just to set the setting, as soon as Elliot walked in and I introduced him, and um, yeah, they they really I didn't even realize that's what was happening. Well, they in the room. Me. Yeah, they were really asking a lot of questions. So, uh, what it's, producers? It, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like what? Well, so that's you can gauge someone's knowledge, taste, involvement in the culture by who they're going to name as their favorite. And to me, I can't name a – I mean, I did name a favorite, but it was someone they had never heard of before. Then they're like, is he making it up? Is this guy whack? Who is this? You know. So then I said, look, the multiple producers. But that's kind of like – we were talking about um, – so I was with some of my uh, – some of the volunteers and instructors who are hip-hop heads, some of them from Oakland, some of them from New York City. 
And we were talking about um, what you can and can't do in terms of when you go to certain places where there are different gangs, right? And uh, Torrance, one of my instructors who I'm gonna meet after this, who flew out from Oakland to teach with us in Philly yesterday and Brooklyn before that, was talking about how his brother was in Fresno and kind of got banged on. So a guy came up to him, he was wearing a Yankees hat in Fresno, that's like a, I think it's like a Crip associated thing because of the color, navy blue. Oh, right, 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 yeah. And if you're wearing a Yankees hat in Fresno, like you're basically banging blue or like that's what it has, it's gang colors, right? And so these guys came up to him and the guy, apparently his brother had no clue and it was better that way. Like, but they go, where are you from? And that's like, when you people want to know where are you from and how long you've been there, right? So in a way, there, there's different ways that people will test you and see if like, can I relate to you? Do I identify with you? Are you part of a certain in-group? Do you understand? And if you're, if you're claiming hip hop, like you better really be about it. Because there's, I've seen like there are a lot of white people who appropriate hip hop because it's cool and because it's convenient and can make them money or make them feel cool. So and so you mentioned that you were working in school. So I got a chance to see you in action. I'm glad you got to see that, which was so cool. So you've worked with over you said seventy five thousand students all yeah. over the world. Yeah, because I because so I've been traveling all over the world over the past I want to say eight years since 2012, 13, something like that. And have now taught on every continent and worked on every continent minus Antarctica. That's bucket list. I want to do a beat battle on Antarctica. Okay, like, we'll make we'll help make that yeah, happen. We get, go from Australia, take the boat down. We'll get like the French and Norwegian, you know, Antarctic mission uh, research teams to have like a beat battle in the little. I see it. I got the vision. Man, I, yeah, I'm, I, it's it's bucket. bucket it's gonna list. happen. But yeah, so I so I've had an incredible. I've been incredibly privileged to have the opportunity to to travel so much, and um, you know and that's something that I make a priority for myself too. But to to be come in contact with so many different cultures and countries and people, but all with that unifying kind of uh, culture and and bridge of hip hop. Now there's a book that just came out about hip hop diplomacy that a professor hip hop diplomacy. Oh, it's a thing. Wow. I've been doing that for years. Yeah, so. I was part of UNC Chapel Hill and U.S. State Department's Next Level program, which is now it's in its sixth generation or iteration. In 2015, I went to Dakar, Senegal, as part of a, a hip hop dipl like diplomatic mission to do peace building, and uh, yeah, what is hip hop diplomacy? It's using the culture of hip hop to build bridges and create understanding between different cultures in the same in the tradition I'm, of y'all. I'm just like in awe, like the whole time my face is just like in wonder. Listening this is what to Louis it. Armstrong did in the in the 30s and 40s when he did that world tour. It's based on that. And so this guy, uh, Mark Katz, wrote a book. Shout out Mark Katz, UNC Chapel Hill. The guy's amazing. Um, started the Next Level program, wrote a book called uh, Built. And I just gave a copy to my mom because I'm quoted in it talking about the therapeutic impact of hip hop for peace building, processing trauma, et, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's a thing. And, and so I've gotten around to do like – I'm always presenting. I'm always doing a workshop. I'm always, you know, linking with someone whenever I can. And so I've had the opportunity to present to very large groups. Like we did in Philly yesterday, we had grades five and six, which was probably like three, 350, 400 kids, and the grade six and seven assemblies, two separate assemblies to get the whole school. And so that's like seven to 800 kids in one day. That's a wild. And I just remember when I walked in two days ago to the room, you could just tell like the kids were really like reserved and like they were They're super so shy <laughs> and like very nervous, like very much like kind of eyeing you up. And then once you started going into like the way that hip hop works and like the, like the ins and outs and like the history of it, you could just tell like the, the energy was lighting up in the room. And then when they got to sit with all these amazing DJs that you bring in, because you have how many DJs have you worked with now? Hundreds. Yeah, I, I mean, mean these are qualified, like successful. They're, re they're really, yeah, they're real. They're they're authentic. And these are these are DJs and, and and beat makers, people who create their own beats and making the beats on the on the machines and and putting out tracks and that kind of thing. And, and not just like people that do it as a side thing, no, which is amazing. Who are yeah, also who are talented, like, I, yeah. there's a lot of value in that. Like, but who are like We're working doing it. into the in, the, in industry. the industry? Yeah, yeah. And it's not that hard of a sell because our slogan is. I wish I had this when I was a kid. And every single volunteer, verbatim, 99.9%, .9%, it, it happens every time we bring them in for the first time or they see the program, they go, man, and I, and I know what they're going to say, verbatim. Everyone says, man, 
I wish I had this either when I was a kid or when I was in school. And then I send them the picture. We have a design that has like a, a, a this guy on a beat machine with all these, you know, it's like a Benetton ad, you know, with all these different colored, you know, kids, like kids that are like, you know, the white kid and, you know, Asian kid. Like it's, it's all these different kids gathered around a beat machine with a, a, a beat maker making beats. And, it, and he's the thought bubble is, I wish I had this when I was a kid. And so we're trying to realize that hip hop, part of the ethos of hip hop is part of the knowledge element of, of hip hop is the idea of mentorship and the phrase each one teach one. And so we're trying, we're we're fulfilling that ethos and that mo and that and that kind of uh, a part of the morality of hip hop to pass along and perpetuate the culture, but also to offer that you know to each one you know each person should teach one you you pass it along, and that's part of the ethos. And and we know we we were all mentored in some way, whether it or or some of us were self taught, and that's why we want to share it and say hey. I, man, I wish I had someone, a mentor or, or someone. I mean, mentoring is so important. When I hear oh, you talk about yeah. that, I also think like these kids that were walking in the room or even people who might be listening. I know for this is for sure for me. I'm just realizing like you can be mentored poorly. And yes. so like relearning yeah. what those right. like solid relationships are like is so valuable. We have to like actually wrap up a yeah, little bit, do. which is unfortunate because I would love to like talk for hours with you. But part you know, two, okay, part two. Happen. Yeah. One thing that we get asked a lot and we kind of touch on this a little earlier is, you know, when I think about like trauma, it's like it sucks so bad. Like it's so hard. I don't yeah. want to go to counseling like this. Like um, as soon as it gets really when you get into the deep stuff where that's yeah. when the works really yeah. starts happening. And then it's like, I don't want to definitely want, don't want to do this. And like I said earlier, like hip hop is just such a unique way to address that. Like if someone was looking at like the story of their life, mm-hmm. how would you encourage them to like figure out, OK, there's got to be something different here that can like support me or help me while I go through this process of healing. Like, how do you figure that out? So the question was, how do you uh, tell your story in an alternative way? Or how do you cope with your trauma in an alternative how way? Do you, how do you deal with your stuff in an alternative way? Um, okay, so as opposed to going into uh, going to, to a traditional psychotherapist or doing traditional psychotherapy. And maybe it's like also like a companion, but like, um, yeah, like what are different Oh, like ways? in addition to that. Yeah, both and. Well, I mean, look... Um, First of all, I didn't know what wellness was until I went on the trip. I thought I was wellness. You thought you as a practitioner, like well, a I mental I, practitioner. I, I thought, well, I help people to be well. But I didn't realize there was a whole, like, wellness community and industry. Like, I kind of maybe vaguely had an idea. But I didn't, like, you knew what wellness was. Everyone on the trip except for me basically knew what knew what wellness so, was. So, like, just set the scene a little bit. Like, this trip that we went on. <laughs> it is real. It um, was, it was le- you know thought leaders about and entrepreneurs us, I guess. Yeah, yeah. who are all in wellness. And I didn't... And that's I'm, a term that's getting tossed around a lot and it, now really being wellness, linked to mental well-being. health. Wellness, yeah. well-being. Yeah. I'm a mental health professional and practitioner, a licensed clinical psychologist. So I deal technically probably in wellness, in mental health and in therapy and, and helping people to have, make, you know, changes and help with their developmental trajectory to have happier, healthier lives. Um, so I didn't know that was a thing. I, I had heard, you know, I kind of maybe used the word loosely wellness and well-being, but I think about mental health um, in kind of different paradigms. There's the whole like deficit model and disorder model, but that's kind of, it really puts people in a box. And I want to think, oftentimes want to think, and it can, it can be convenient for talking to mental health practitioners and being able to kind of start to categorize and to talk in a concrete way. But I also like to think about what do people need in order to help them to develop or to move past a block, right? And so Freud talked about neuroses, being, you know, being stuck. You want to get better, but you also, there's a reason that you're staying stuck. And you can't, you keep on having, you know, I don't know, abusive relationships, you know, finding yourself in abusive relationships. Yeah. We unconsciously keep on reproducing a traumatic situation. So um, I think there, aside from traditional psychotherapy, that the idea of practicing yoga, um, meditation, the kind of guided meditation that you did at the beginning, right? I think are really helpful because they help downregulate our stress response system, but it doesn't have to be limited to that. And I'm not like a new agey person. I believe in in meditation for the value that it has to help me in a functional way. And, and you know, I'm, I'm spiritual, not in an airy-fairy way, but like in a way that I, I'm a humanist. I'm a secular humanist. So um, I don't believe in like the, the force or, high, you know, I don't know, and all that stuff. <laughs> anyway, it's not important. It's 
So there are, there are ways that we can help ourselves to calm down, to heal, to progress, but you want to find ways to not repeat the same maladaptive or self-defeating patterns, hopefully, right, right that, that, yeah. we, that we find ourselves in and not cope in ways that hurt or hinder us. And so, you know, having, I have a friend who, unfortunately, you know, he, his, his housemate suicided and he found him and he oh, was, geez. he was crazy. That's yeah. horrible. He, and, I, and I've been trying to give, get him into therapy if he, if he can, but also to help him to think about ways to help himself. But he goes on walks with his dog and makes beats, makes beats yeah. to, to regulate his anxiety. He's dealing with PTSD and he's kind of vaguely aware of that, but you know, walking, exercise, social connectedness, it cannot be understated, is one of the most fundamentally important things. Healthy social relationships, not being isolated, because people... Yeah, I mean, that for me is like big, like I withdraw because I don't know how to communicate, like I don't know what to say. But healthy relationships, because we have unhealthy relationships too. Totally. People who are not toxic, who are not going to dump their trauma on you, who can help you process what you need to process, um, who are supportive, who are kind, who can model good coping behaviors for us and not, you know, offer us, you know, self-defeating or negative coping behaviors. Like if you have a friend who's an alcoholic, it's probably not the best to hang out with them or a, or a drug addict or an addict to whatever. You can be addicted to sex, food, whatever. You want people who live healthier lifestyles, who encourage you to be a better person and, and let you proceed at your own pace. And I think that's really important. Wow, that, you, yeah, you, that makes sense. You should never, and this is a guiding principle of doing psychotherapy and helping people with trauma, you never force or make someone process their trauma, quote unquote, process their trauma before they're ready. They have to do it on their own terms, at their own pace, and you, you don't just make people talk about it. So like it. honoring where someone is at. Even yeah. I, I just think that even like in friendships, like honoring someone in, in their where they where they're at exactly where they're at but offering supportive stuff one thing that really is a huge theme on the show which is so interesting I didn't expect it is this value of community so maybe when you come back you can talk so a little important. bit about yeah. community um, and it also just makes me think like you know whatever the thing is that will support you while you go to um, while you seek professional help because I think that's so valuable to your point of like we can be in the wellness community but it really if you're working if you're dealing with some hard stuff you um, should be seeing a professional working with a professional is so vital but there are all these other components that can really support yeah, you on the way yeah, yeah. And like and you can find it you will find it you just you know there's exercise, so much art therapy yeah. yeah exercise arts music again if it has a positive impact if it's not taking you into negative situations or becoming like an, an addiction when, once something you, you depend on it in an addictive way it's not healthy right moderation that it's a cliche it's a trope but like you know moderation is key right that's really important so wait but how do you Oh my gosh, I, there are so many other things I want to I'll ask just, you. I'll just, okay, but really yeah, quick, yeah, yeah. on that point, how do you know when you're addicted to something? This is like opening a can of worms. When, when, you, when you are rigid and cannot use something else to cope with it, you need to have some flexibility in the way that you cope with things. If the way you cope with your trauma is by constantly doing drugs or being addicted to drugs or alcohol or yeah. sex or food, it's only one way that you can cope with it and it becomes an obsessive, um, you know, a... Uh, uh, just you're dependent on that and you can't use any other ways to cope with it, that's when it's an addiction or a problem. When you're inflexible and you're rigid and you can only use that, right? As opposed to, oh, maybe today instead of doing exercise, I'm going to just relax or I'm going to go to a movie. Wow, maybe, so it's like all that deregulation and then like self-soothing and grounding. Yeah, and maybe, maybe today instead of like, you know, smoking a joint, I'm going to go for a run or a walk or hang out with friends, play man, a board game. Man, there takes like so much hope that that stuff will work in order for it to like stick. I know for me, like I started doing ballet, like my neuropsychologist was like, you need to get some hobbies. And I was like, I don't know what those are. Hobbies um, are so important. But I like didn't even know where to start. So my gym, like at my gym, this guy social. like encouraged me to, yeah. to do ballet and it's been really hard, but it's been really great. Um, just some like closing thoughts, like how yeah. do we like – I can't even tell you how cool it was to see your workshop in person. Like, I want to just encourage everyone listening, like, please get involved with um, Dr. Elliot Gans or Elliot or Dr. Gans um, work. Or Dr. Beats. Dr. Beats. Um, it is the coolest, like, and just witnessing the kids. I mean, there's so many ways to get involved with your work, but like, what? where can we find you? How can we support you? How can we encourage you? 
So you can find us on the web at todaysfuturesound.org. No plural on the sound, plural on the today. So todaysfuturesound.org. We're on Instagram at todaysfuturesound. We're on Twitter at TFS underscore beats, B-E-A-T-S. We're on YouTube, Today's Future Sound. Um, they are everywhere. We're and everywhere. I link to all that. Yeah, and, and then, and then uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, I'm just going to say, just sharing our videos and tagging us on social media. We're on Facebook, Today's Future Sound as well. Sharing our videos, commenting, um, sharing it, sending it, spreading it through your social media, signing up for our mailing list. We're about to launch our annual fundraiser on Giving Tuesday, and that is part of our like existential that our survival, right? And we really need community support in terms of tax-deductible donations. But if you can't do that, just telling people about it and spreading it and letting folks know that, you know, therapeutic hip-hop interventions exist. Hip-hop therapy exists. Hip-hop education exists. There's other ways of learning and doing and sharing our model. Um, if you work in a corporation that has a lot of money and does team building, we do corporate team building. I'm also a presenter and I, and I do uh, speaking engagements. Ellie uh, is like, everywhere all around the world so i would definitely link to all of that and just for you guys we have a special treat we're gonna um Get we're, some beats going on. we're gonna we're yeah. gonna um add some beats onto this unfortunately people watching on youtube won't be able to see it but we will definitely add it um at the end so you can hear it but it is i'm elliot like I, I'm like so lit up in the room right now. I just can't even tell you. You're Thank much, you so much. much more regulated and happier than you were at the beginning of the show. And well, I was, I was driving like you crazy with dental floss. Uh, Elliot was flossing in the middle of the I'm, show. I'm, I stay flossing. I stay flossing. It, you know, dental health is really important. It, it is. I floss every health. night. It. Thank you. It does. Most people don't know that. Or yeah, think it can about affect that. your hormones. Hormones. Oh my God, we could hormones? just go on forever. Your, yeah. your heart health. Your heart health. I know that hormones as well. Yeah, because of all that it can really like just um, deregulate. I don't know what the word is. Baby, if you're listening. I'm just saying, you should floss. Wait, your 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 partner doesn't floss. No, she. I mean, we're like outing you. You oh, gotta floss. Oh, I'm in big trouble. Oh, I I, I, I got my trouble. husband about that too. Like, if, that's the thing that you don't. Okay, we have to end. Not not super reg. Not as I'm very consistent every single night. I I, I you know I try to I try to. Urge. Oh my god, you guys! Okay. I'm so sorry. Okay, sorry, Elliot. Flossing. I adore you. Flossing Come is back, important, please. and it and it's regul it's regulating too. It's rhythmic regulation to calm you down. Totally, totally. All right, you're the best. I adore you. Thank you so you much too. for coming on. I appreciate on. you.